Hello and welcome back to Rebellious Menstruation and my must own popular series book reviews of books that I like and that I feel like reviewing. Yay! Today we are looking at California native Janet Fitch's 1999 novel White Oleander. This novel is also an infamous member of Oprah's book club starring in the May 1999 month. But that is fabulous, really, because book clubs encourage reading and you shouldn't be shamed for what you want to read. I love Oprah anyway, and May is my birth month. However, back to the book. Being that this year is the 20th anniversary of White Oleander. White Oleander is about Astrid, who is 12 at the start of the book, and her mother, Ingrid. His beautiful poet aesthetic has made her self-absorbent, a self-absorbed yet fiercely independent. And Astrid actually is acutely in tune with her mother's um, feeling uh, regarding Astrid herself and the distinct entrapment she feels. They live in LA. Ingrid works a mundane job to support them. And Astrid is a sponge to the lessons her mother provides. As unyielding as they are. And it is so close um, and is so close to Ingrid. She notices the subtle changes within her mother as she genuinely falls in love with a man even Astrid knows is far beneath them both. It seems a strange choice for Ingrid to make considering Astrid suspects that Ingrid chose her birth father solely on the base he was her mirror image and she could essentially have a child with herself. In, however, Ingrid breaks all the rules and does them for a strange, ugly, vapid man with whom she murders when he does exactly as expected and goes out with another, younger prettier girl. The, this results in, of course, Ingrid's arrest, trial and imprisonment and the start, really, of Astrid's coming-of-age journey in the foster care system. She is placed at the start, or her first placement is with Star, a former stripper, recovering addict and born-again Christian. And she has an affair with Uncle Ray, Star's boyfriend. This, pla this placement ends when Star, figuring out or noticing the affair that Astrid and Ray are having, relapses in her drug abuse and shoots Astrid. Post-recovery, because she spends obviously a couple of weeks in hospital, she is placed in the suburbs as an unpaid babysitter or nanny to add to Ed and Marvel Turlock, whose racist attitudes towards neighbour Olivia Johnstone end up being Astrid's undoing. As Astrid, of course, is attracted to the beauty and culture of Olivia in the vapid and mundane suburbia landscape. Astrid is next placed with the wealthy Amelia Ramos. However, she is starved and abused again in this foster home until a new caseworker removes her and places her with failed and places her with the failed actor Claire Richards and her husband Ron. While this is often considered to be Astrid's best placement in the system, she is effectively brought in as a nanny companion for the emotionally damaged Claire. And of course, by this time, the 17-year-old Astrid knows that she is the unpaid babysitter for Claire. And the lives that she will never had are really represented by Claire. The house, schooling, parenting, future, degree and life that she will never be able to have access to, trust or be around. And in this house, this family, more than in any of the other homes, are really what break Astrid. 
star and Astrid rebellious affair with him, uh, emblematic of the trial uh, trauma she was feeling at the time. She considered herself very much other from the lower class star and workman Roy. The Turlocks really represented her post-traumatic experience, presenting her the beauty of Olivia, but ensuring that she, who has been taught by her mother that beauty is the be-all and end-all of life, is broken of beliefs installed by her mother. As in, Olivia is cultured and beautiful, but also represents essentially a prostitute. Amelia Ramos makes her ugly by starving her. She removes Astra's beauty and strips her of her, of her humanity. Claire, the on-the-surface perfect foster carer, is actually the disaster. She and her husband have elected to foster a teenager as a last resort, as a focus for the depressed, emotionally unstable, suicidal, and paranoid Claire. And this shakes loose any connection to the life Astrid thought she should have. And upon Claire's suicide, she ends up in the children's foster group home, McLaren's, or colloquially known as Max. And she connects with another damaged child, Paul Trout, before agreeing um, while rejecting multiple families before agreeing to be placed with her last family, Russian hustler Rina Groshenka. Astrid is is attracted to Rina's hustle and attitude, and this last placement gives her the ability to reconcile with her own decisions and the life choices that have been thrust upon her. While she has another affair with Rina's boyfriend, her disaffection is apparent unlike the desperate affair with Ray in her first foster home. Her contact with her mother is scattered during these times of foster care, alternating between the attitudes of the parents of which home she is placed in. However, this Astrid, this one that lives with Rena, is approached by sycophants of her mother, who are aiming at getting Ingrid out of prison. Ingrid is appalled by this version of Astrid, this this gothic, second-hand clothes, dock-wearing attitude, who smokes and drinks. This version of Astrid, who was grown from her trauma and understood the lessons from Rena, life is not your friend, it is your jailer. It makes sense for Astrid in a way her mother was her jailer, but she was released too early and she was released from this too early into the ugliness of life. When Astrid ages out of care, she finds Paul Trout, the other autistic kid from the group home, and travels to Europe. It is important to note here that she does actually catch up with her Danish father and realises that her mother was right about him, the weakness and the sadness of him and reconciles that she was probably happier and better without him. When Ingrid is released from prison, Astrid, at 20 and living in Berlin, Germany, is looking at a choice, Paul or her mother, and comparing the freezing temperatures of Berlin, German apartment with the warmth of LA and the heat of California and the Santa Ana winds, that were right, that were brought in at the start of the story. This kind of uh, question or this choice that she has is kind of left open at the end. While it appears that she would be choosing Paul, her call, her siren call is always to her mother. This book was converted into a movie in 2002 and they uh, only uh, they took selected three of the stories in the book, or three of the foster homes in the book, um, rather than the five. Uh, they bought over Star and Ray, the first uh, house, Claire and Ron, and Rena, 
so kind of the first, the third and the last. They also bought over Paul Trout and Mac. Um, but of course this is understandably due to the constraints of the format change. However, the movie it took Astrid's character development and made her a fake angry child. Rather than, like it's obvious that they removed all of the personality development and sacrificed her to the homicidal selfish Ingrid. They removed the father substory and replaced it all with this teen angsty pseudo-gothic. They removed the European travel and replaced it with a faux court case that Astrid attends in the film. Look, I do not like this movie. And this usually happens with books that I really love that get translated into movies. They often miss the major points of the book. For an example of an excellently translated book to film, see Lord of the Rings. That book is big and unwieldy and they translated the major plot points in the story exceptionally well. This, however, White Oleander does not. This movie takes a story of murder, foster homes, crime, abuse and growing up and puts them in a pretty blonde filter with lots of pseudo-drama rather than the actual drama that's in the book. Honestly, it is already so dramatic enough. You don't need to throw away a dirty dress or, you know, include all the blondes to actually make it dramatic. Read the book is my point. Janet Fitch is an LA native and this shows in the descriptions of LA in White Oleander where a lot of the descriptions of this city read as if a love letter. She attended Reed College, won a scholarship to England's Keele University and taught at the University of Southern California. She quotes her favourite authors as Dostoevsky and Edgar Allan Poe and has uh, written several books including Kicks, released in 1996, obviously White Oleander in 1999, Paint It Black in 2006 and The Revolution of Marina M. in 2017. Uh, Paint It Black, the uh, 2006's Paint It Black, also became a film in 2016. Uh, this is the only other book I've read of Janet Fitch's, and I was not a real big fan of Paint It Black. However, I actually kind of enjoyed the movie. Um, the movie is very well done by Amber Tamblin, um, so uh, you can always check that out. Check that out. It's also up here on YouTube if you want to have a look. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the day. And of course, I will see you all in the next video. Bye.